Okay, assignment two. Any questions about assignment two? So I told you that um, I the announcement that I won't be here next week. Um, so what I've done is I uh, is well. So for assignment two, it means it's due next Thursday, but I won't be around to answer any questions of it next week. And also at the um, we don't have TA, so it means that if you want to ask questions about it now or Thursday would be the time to to ask them. So does anyone have any questions yet about assignment two? And you'll notice is that there's an Excel sheet that goes along with assignment two. And so when you turn it in, what I'm looking for you to do is to basically turn in the, you know, you can write it, do it all on the Excel sheet if you want, you put your answers in there or do it with this and then send me the Excel sheet. Okay, questions about that? All right. <clears throat> okay, so last time we were going through all these examples about, about basically how you calculate insurance rates, right? Fair premium. And then what happens when you have a deductible? What happens when you have a, a, a co-payment? And then what happens when you have both a deductible and a co-payment? So let me change over to the So we're going through all these different types of, uh, of examples. So, you know, start off with a very simple one where five people, everyone in that five people, see, here's the simple one, 10 people, 10 people, they all get a $2,000 loss. And so, you know, the way you do it is you sum up all the losses, divide by the number of people, 10, that gives your premium. And then what this column does is basically just verifies that the total premiums equal the total losses. Okay. So did that one. Questions about that? All right. Then did this one. So well now I still have 10 people, but now four of them get an accident, four of them don't get an accident. And the key thing here is that the company can't tell who it is that's going to get an accident, who's not going to get an accident. And also that the people don't know. So it's truly random on both sides. They can, they know that five people get an accident and that the average will be 4,000. And I mean, the cost will be 4,000 per person, but they don't know who they are. And the people don't know if they're one for one who's gonna get an accident. So again, adds 20,000, divide by 10, number of people, that's 2,000. So that's the fair premium. Next one. They see that the, the company in this case does know who they are. And so the, the thought here is that, well, if the company can tell who they are, then the company just set, charges them based upon how much risk they have, right? So if you if they know that you're gonna get an accident for $4,000, then the fair premium is to charge you $4,000. And they know that if, you know, if you're not gonna get an accident, then they know the fair premium is $1,000. So if the company could tell, um, then they're going to charge different amounts. Then went through and said, okay, so now what if they, um, the company knows uh, but um, can't tell it's going to ha have an accident and there's high and low risk people. So now it breaks it up into two different groups. So here's the high risk people where three, pe three out of five get an accident. Here's the low risk people where one out of five get an accident. And so the premiums for this group are the sum of the losses divided by the number of people. So 15,000 divided by five, that's 3,000. So everyone gets charged $3,000. And then in this one, it's sum of the losses is $5,000 divided by the number of people, five. So it's $1,000. So everyone gets charged $1,000. Good. So that's why we suddenly start writing it this way, because now what this requires is just basically different groups. 
different groups of people who have different type of risk levels. So you have you know, group one, the low risk, group two, medium, and all the way up. And so in this case now, if the company you know, can tell how much, you know, who's gonna, um, who's, you know, what type they are, then they just charge them different amounts, right? They charge based upon what their expected cost is. So this is the case where companies can go through and that they can identify kind of who's risky and who's not risky. So we said in auto insurance, you can tell who's risky by number of accidents, type of car you drive, all these different things, right? Can tell you the level of risk. So they divide you up into different type of risk categories. The way they used to do it for health is that they would also divide you up into different type of risk categories. That they would divide you up and say, you know, if you're no family history and you're young, then you're at low risk. If you're, you know, older, then so they they divide you based upon various types of cap of characteristics that determine your health risk. But it's the same basic idea. Then they charge you amount, the fair premium, I should say, is the amount for your group. Then we went through and said, you know, that now if they can't tell, if they can't tell, if you have different groups and they can't tell who's, you know, they they can't tell. But again, If group one here, right, they're, you know, if they're a low risk and they know they're a low risk, then they're going to be paying 390 and yet their expected cost is zero, right? So if that's the case, then, then they sort of feel like they're getting screwed. Well, not getting screwed, they're just paying more than their expected loss is going to be. Whereas this group here, group four, their you know their expected cost is five thousand, and they're paying three ninety, so therefore they're paying less in premiums than what it's expected to cost. Yeah. Are we going to develop like a graph that different? You mean are you going to do this? Yeah. 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 So there's an Excel table in homework and just basically fill it out. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm going through this in. <laughs> in excruciating detail. So you can see all the numbers that I'm putting in because this is what you have to do for your homework. Okay. So then we said, well, what happens if you have a deductible? And we said, well, I said, I said, well, what happens is that, well, people, you know, if this is the loss per year, and it's a, I think we did a, let's do a $500 deductible rather than a, Hundred dollars. You get a five hundred dollars deductible, like that. And we said with a five hundred dollar deductible is what happens that well people pay the first five hundred. So like this group zero, they pay nothing because they don't have any loss. But group one, they pay you know their loss is a thousand dollars, so they have five hundred dollar deductible, which means that they pay five hundred. The insurance company pays five hundred. Group two. They pay 500 and the insurance company pays 1500. Group three, 500 and 4,500. So that when you, you know, that all for the premium standpoint, all that matters is the amount that the insurance company pays, not the amount that you pay. So in this case, then you just add up, this is the sum of what the insurance company pays per person, you know, for the total number of people. So you get 290, and then you divide that by the number of people, or 1,000, and you get. $290 is the average cost. So that's the fair premium. So when I when I increase the uh, the deductible, what happens to the premium? Does it go up or down? If the deductible goes up, does the premium go up or premium go down? Premium goes down, right? So if we change this to a thousand dollar deductible. Like that, then the premium goes down to 190. Because basically people are paying more and the insurance company is paying less. On the other hand, if it's a hundred dollars or fifty dollars deductible, like that, then now the insurance company is paying more, and so now the premiums go up. Got it? So deductible goes up, premiums go 
down. Deductible goes down, premium goes up. The next one we went through was copayment. So copayments differ from deductibles and that copayments, you pay a certain amount on them uh, for each, uh, for, for every visit or, you know, for each, for all your losses, you pay a certain amount. So if you have a, a deduct, a copayment, 20% copayment, then what you do is that means that for every, every loss, you pay 20% of it. So this is just equal to, oh, maybe 10%, let's go back to 20%. So if you have a twenty percent copayment, then it means that you know that you're paying everyone. This person pays twenty percent of five thousand, which is a thousand. Pays twenty percent of two thousand, which is four hundred, etc. So what the again what the insurance company pays is what's left over, and you add all that up, and that's the total losses. And you divide by the number of people, and you get the average premium of three hundred twelve dollars. So if the deductible goes up. Does the premiums go down or up? The deductible goes up, the premiums go down, or premiums go down. Premiums go down. Mm -hmm. So if we do a 40% deductible, it's now the premiums go down from 312 down to 234. Which makes sense because the insurance, when, when you pay more. When you pay a higher percent, then the insurance company pays less. If the premium, if the deductible was a hundred, a hundred percent, how much would your premium be? Zero, right? Because you're not, they're not paying anything yet. You're paying everything. And then the last one we went through, or we started to go through, is what happens if you have a deductible and a copayment. So it gets kind of complicated um, because you know you could think about. People paying a deductible and then paying a copayment. People paying a, a copayment and that their copayment adds up to their deductible. So there's different ways to happen. Like oftentimes, the, what the insurance companies will do is that they'll say that they'll put a, a deductible on you, like you pay 15% or 10% um, of your bills until you reach a certain level. And then they'll kick in and they'll pay more of it after that. So what that's doing is it's saying, you know, that there's a deductible, a total amount that you're going to pay. Of let's say five thousand dollars. So if you go through and that you use it one time and it costs you a hundred dollars, then that adds to your five thousand dollar kind of limit. And then the more you use it, it just keeps adding up how much you know you're paying. And when what you pay total reaches five thousand dollars, is that then suddenly they'll they'll say, oh, we're going to pay ninety five percent of it now, or we'll pay hundred percent. So that's a case where the insurance company is using the deductible to kind of you know it's. It's basically it's maxing out the amount that that you um, have to spend. But the other way to do it is like this way, where the insurance company says, "Well, you pay everything first until you reach a deductible, and then we'll pay a certain percentage of it." It's like I think I told you about my my brother who had the the bad insurance policy, and so he had a ten thousand dollar deductible, and then he had a um, twenty no thirty percent twenty five percent copayment about that. So I mean that he paid everything up to ten thousand, and 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 this is not just a like you know, uh, yeah he paid everything up to ten thousand, and then he paid twenty five percent of everything beyond that. So it meant you know if he's going to the doctor's office, he's going to the doctor's office a lot, and paying for that out of the pocket, and then when he suddenly has spent ten thousand dollars, then the next time he spends a thousand dollars, the insurance company will pay eight hundred up or seven hundred fifty. That's another way to do a deductible. That's the way I'm sort of treating it here. I'm saying, okay, so the individual pays first how much they're going to pay. And then whatever's left over, then they pay some amount of that. So what the insurance company pays then is that they pay basically, they don't pay the deductible, and then they don't pay the percentage of, that the individual um, is paying. So like in this case, let's, let's clear all this and we'll, and we'll show you. So let's say it looks like that. And that there's a $500 deductible and a 20% copayment. 
Well, okay, first thing you do then is you take out, you know, how much is the individual going to pay? They're going to pay $500 just off the bat. So like these people here in group one, how much will they pay? Zero, because they're not, they have no losses. So they just pay zero. These people, how much will they pay? 500. These people, group three, 500, because it's a $500 deductible. So they all pay, you know, further losses. They all pay the initial 500. So then, this is then after the deductible. So that's equal to basically you know, their loss minus the deductible like that. So it's still zero for this group because they have no losses. This group here, it's 500. This one's 1500 because you know 2000, they then pay 500. So this is what's left over to pay. And now the individual pays 20% of that. So it's equal to this times 0 0.20, yeah. 0.20 times 20 like that. So this person, they pay you know, this times 0 0.20. That. Going all the way down. Oh dear, that's not right. There you go, 0.20, so it looks like that. So now if you say, well, how much in total does, does the person pay? Well, this person pays zero for their deductible plus zero in copayments, so that amount. This person pays 500 for the deductible plus 100, like that. This person pays their 500 deductible plus the 20% what's left over. So 800, and then this person pays 500 plus the 900. So it looks like that. So to figure out the premiums then is that you go and you, you, know, you look at what the insurance company pays. So the insurance, so this is what the individual pays right here. We'll put that in yellow. Let's see. This is what the individual pays. And then this is the total loss over here. And what the insurance company pays is basically the total loss minus what the individual pays. So they pay this amount minus that amount. So they pay zero for that person. They pay 1,000 minus 600. So 400 for that person. 2,000 minus 800. And equals 500 minus 1,400. So it looks like that. Got it? So then, you know, you that's the insur what the insurance company pays. You add them all up. And then um, you know, here's what the insurance company pays here. Add those things all up. And that, that's what you get for the, um, for the total amount. Divide by the number of people. That's the fair premium is 232. Questions about that? Questions about that? Thinking is that you're going to have to recreate this on the assignment. What I would suggest you do is try to recreate it between now and Tuesday, I mean Thursday, and then you'll be you'll have more pointed questions on Thursday. Good? Yeah. Yeah, these are already uploaded. Um, they're up, they should be on online uh, in the module. Um, and that the, the Excel, I gave you an Excel sheet for the assignment and that's uploaded too. It's not there. Oh, really? Okay, well, I think it's there. I, if it's not there, I, I checked this morning. Um, so, but sometimes what happens is I load things up and then I always forget that you have to go click another box to basically publish it. But I think I published it. That's it. That's the guy. Okay. So let's see. So we've gone through all these things now. All right. Went through that, went through that, went through that. 
Yeah, went through that. And so you're you're good to go on it. Correct? Okay. So now we're going to talk about why it is that we've spent, we've gone over this in painful detail. So the reason we did this in painful detail is um is because uh, one because it's good to know how insurance works. Um, it's one of those life things that I think everyone's you know has to at some point grapple with. But the other thing is that it explains a lot about the Affordable Care Act and, and some of the issues that arose when they were trying to put together the Affordable Care Act and then also when they were trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act. So first thing, if you just, you know, so if we think about how this is working now, is that you've got, you know, insurance, um, you've got two different types of insurance. You have experience rating and community rating. Experience rating is when they rate based upon your individual risk patterns. And then community rating is when they rate you as a group. So what we're talking about experience rating, that's where the insurance company can see what type you are and they can go and that they can charge you a different amount based upon the type that, that you are. That's experience rating. Community rating is when they either can't see what type you are. So they don't know whether you're low or high risk or they're not able to charge you different amounts. Then you do community rating. So like in the university here, you know, we, we do community rating, but the community is basically just university employees. So it's a very specific group. If I was in that, um, if I worked as a, uh, an undersea welder, which I think is one of the most dangerous jobs is undersea welder. If I worked as undersea welder and got my insurance through my undersea welding company is that the rates would be a lot higher because, because you know, that's my community group is basically un other undersea welders. So they rate you basically on what type of group you're in. And so, but then once you're in that group, you get charged for that um, for that community, you know, the community that you're in. It's kind of it's called partial community rating because it's, you know, it is community rating, but it's it's they do it for smaller groups. So you know how you can see how deductibles work now, and you see how um, how uh, co-insurance works. So I want to talk about basically three different problems that occur with insurance. Adverse selection, moral hazard, and then supplier-induced demand. Okay, adverse selection occurs when there's what's called asymmetric information. Asymmetric information means that one group has more information than another group. And it, it, when this first kind of came out is that um, it came out in this very famous paper a research paper that came out in the 1960s, actually by a guy over here at Berkeley, um, that talked about the market for lemons. And in this case, the lemons were cars. And what he claimed in this is that, well, if you as a buyer can't tell the difference between a high quality used car and a low quality used car, but the, but the dealer can, then what will happen is that the only cars that will be sold by dealers are low quality cars. And the logic goes like this. It says, well, suppose that you had, suppose that you had a, uh, um, there are two types of cars, good used cars and bad used cars. And you can't tell the difference, but the, but the dealer could, can. And let's say a good used car sells for $10,000 and a bad used car is worth $5,000. So if you're going to go buy a car and in a used car dealership, you see these, this car sitting there. You don't know whether it's a good used car or a bad used car but you know that the dealer knows if it is. How much are you gonna be willing to pay for this car? How much would you be willing to pay for this car? If you didn't, so good used car, 10,000, bad used car, 5,000. How much would you be willing to pay for this car? How many people would be willing to pay $10,000? How many would be willing to pay $5,000? But if it was $5,000, there's a chance it's a good car. And so the dealer is going to say, no, I'm not going to sell you that. This is a good car, right? But you don't know if it, the dealer's lying to you or not. 
So if, the deal, if you don't know if the dealer's lying, but they're always going to say, no, this is a good used car. So what you might do is that you might come to and say, well, okay, I'll pay $7,500. I'll just split the difference. Pay $7,500. Now, if this is a good used car that the dealer is selling, will they sell it to you for $7,500? No. The dealer will know this is a good used car. Um, so it means that you know, you're going to, therefore, only buy it. You know, the dealer won't sell you a car if that's a good used car because you're never going to be willing to pay $10,000 for it. So what happens is that basically people start, start to just say, well, I'm going to assume all cars are bad cars. And so therefore, I'm only going to pay $5,000 for this car. And when that happens, what ha you know, people, the dealer just can't sell good used cars anymore. And so all the dealer is going to end up with is bad used cars. Because people who want to sell it, you know, a car for $10,000, they won't be able to, to sell it. That's the market for lemons. It means if you're in a situation where you can't tell the quality, you can't tell the quality is that what happens is that all the, the good cars get driven out of the market and the only cars that are left are bad cars. That's called adverse selection. So it occurs um, in health when you have healthy people and you have I mean, healthy low cost people and you have um, unhealthy, high-cost people trying to buy the uh, um, insurance. So if, if they're trying to buy health insurance, and uh, um, and the in this case, the uh, the person knows what type they are, but the insurance, the health insurance company doesn't know if you're a, a good or a bad person. So let's say the the healthy people are you're going to cost five thousand a year, and you unhealthy people on this side of the room, sorry people are going to cost $10,000 a year. So if I'm an insurance company, how much am I going to charge people? What's the fair premium? If there's 50% of the people are healthy, 50% of the people are unhealthy, 5,000, 10,000, what's the fair premium? If you are people are healthy, 50% unhealthy, 5,000, 10,000. What's the middle of that? 7,500? Seven, $7,500. So the insurance company, the fair premium is going to be $7,500. So I come over to you, un, uh, healthy people, and I say, you can buy health insurance for $7,500. Would you pay that? Would you pay $7,500 for your health insurance? healthy people. Well, you're going to say, but I'm healthy. The insurance company can't tell, right? You can't tell the difference between the two of you, can't, between unhealthy and healthy. So the insurance company is not going to say, well, you know, I'm not going to just charge you 5,000 because if I ask these people, are you healthy? They're going to say, you bet, I'm healthy. So everyone's going to tell me that they're healthy. So I can't, so I somehow, you know, I can't tell the difference. I know that half the people are unhealthy, so I'm just going to charge you all the fair premium of 7500 But if I do that, then these healthy people over here are going to say, well, wait a minute, we're just paying too much. And so what they'll do is they'll start to drop out. So maybe now, instead of half the people being healthy and half the people being unhealthy, now maybe 25% of the people drop out over here. So you have 25% of the low-cost people drop out but not the high cost people. They're all still in there because they're thinking, woohoo, $7,500. That's a good deal. I know it's really going to cost me um, $10,000. So now, now the price goes up then to $8,000. So it's at $8,000 now. And so I'm going to these healthy people and saying, well, now it's going to be $8,000 because some of these, you know, some of these other people dropped out. Now it's going to be $8,000. So what happens now is that they say, forget it. I'm not going to do it. So they just keep dropping out. And so the only people who are left by insurance are the unhealthy people. And the fair premium for the unhealthy people is $10,000. So in healthcare, the way that this works is that if, if, you, if the insurance company can't charge people different amounts, then young people, you know, healthy people feel like they're paying too much. And so a lot of them won't buy health insurance. 
the more that they don't buy health insurance, the higher the average cost goes. And the higher the average cost goes, the more that these people start dropping out. And so as a result, the only people left are the unhealthy people. That's called a death spiral. So sometimes you'll hear them talking about how the Affordable Care Act was going into a death spiral. What they were talking about is that they were saying, if the unhealthy people, uh, the healthy people, if you don't get enough healthy people there and you're only being charged with the premium for the unhealthy people, is that then premiums just keep going up and up and up. And pretty much the only people are left are the really, really unhealthy ones because they're the only ones who stay in. You know, they're the only ones who are getting a good deal all the way through. So to show you what I mean. Okay, so let's say that here's the insurance and they can tell the difference between the four groups, right? So if this is the cost per person. What are they going to charge each person, each group? So if they can tell the difference, what are they going to charge? How much will they charge the low risk people? Zero. Sure. How much will they charge group two? Thousand, right? Group three, two thousand, group four, five thousand. So if they can tell the difference and they can charge different amounts, then that's what they'll charge. <clears throat> then we said, well, what if they can't tell the difference or they can't charge different amounts? Well, now, you know, these people here, everyone's got to be charged the same amount, 390. So it means that these people here are paying 390, but their cost is really only zero. So they're getting a bad deal. Where these people here in group four, they're paying 390, but their cost is 5,000. So they're getting a good deal. So what happens in this case is that, you know, here's the over, oops, come back. Here's the over or under payment right there, right? This last column. These people are paying $390 more than what it costs them. These people are paying $4,000 less than it costs them. So what happens is that people start to drop out. And as they start to drop out, that means that the only people left are basically the high risk type of people. So the, this is what the death spiral looks like. It says that, okay, at first one, here's your group one, you know, where everyone's paying $309. Um, so this is the fair premium here. These people are overpaying by $309. So what if they all just say, I'm out of here, I'm dropping out. Well, now, now they have 0% have insurance. And so now these people, this becomes the fair premium, 1950, because all the young people are gone. So that becomes not, and now this group here, they're paying too much because their cost is only $1,000 and they're paying 1950. So they say, I'm out of here. So they drop out too. And now the, the premiums then go up to 2,900 because the only people left by insurance are the groups three and four, the high risk people. And so now this group three is saying, wait a minute, I'm paying $900 too much for my insurance. So they drop out. So then eventually the only people in insurance are the high risk people and they're paying the full cost, $5,000. That's the death spiral. That's adverse selection. It's the same thing we talked about with genetic testing. Same type of logic. With genetic testing, what it means is that people can see their costs. And so they know if you know, you know whether you're a high cost person, and so what you're going to do is you're, if you're a high cost person, you and the insurance company doesn't know, then you're going to want to buy health insurance. And so what the insurance company would say is that, well, what genetic testing does is it tells people basically what their cost categories are in ways that the insurance company doesn't know. So the insurance company was afraid that all these high risk people would then rush out and buy lots of insurance because they knew that they, that they had all these genetic conditions and the insurance company wouldn't know. So the insurance company said, you know, we're fine for you to get your genetic information as long as you give us your genetic information. Because if they have it, then they can properly price you. But they said, if you get your genetic information and it's really useful and we don't have your genetic information, 
then we're going to have adverse selection. Is that people who are high high cost and know they're high cost are going to buy too much and going to buy lots of insurance, and that means that you just have lots of people who are um, very unhealthy buying all the insurance. Adverse selection. They gave up on that. Oh dear. They gave up on that on this whole area because it just turned out that it wasn't that useful to get um, to get genetic information as long as they had family history. It's one reason. Second reason is they realize it's better just to wait until someone has a, a loss, and, you know, makes a claim, then try to, to cancel them. It's an even better idea. But then also the affordable care came along. And what the affordable care came along is said, is said, well, you can't bar people, you can't charge people different amounts based upon what their risk levels are. So how did the Affordable Care Act then? You know, because and what they said is that well, if you, you know, if you do this, is that if you come through and say everyone goes in the same risk pool, there's no pre-existing condition, you know, you can charge, you can't charge different amounts on pre-existing condition. What what will happen is that, you know, is that you're going to have lots of unhealthy people buy insurance, which happened right away. When the Affordable Care, Care Act came out, even before it was announced, they did sort of like a um, a policy that they allowed people to buy, and instantly lots of people went out and bought it. And the people who bought it were people without insurance who didn't have um, who had poor health. So the group that bought that initial insurance policy were all the high risk people because the premiums were pretty low. So it meant that the you know the that they, the government knew that they were going to lose money on it because basically these are all high risk people. But they did it because those are the people who really needed the health insurance. And then the Affordable Care Act, when it finally kicked in, how did they ensure that all you low-risk people bought health insurance? How'd they do it? How did they mandate that? That's a hint. It's a hint for you as an individual to answer the question. You're the individual mandate. That's what the individual mandate was all about. Is it said, everyone's got to get insurance. And if you don't buy insurance, we're going to fine you. We're going to come through and we're going to, you know, it was going to be like $900 after a couple of years. Then it sort of goes up from there. And as you see, when you go through the history discussions and we talk about the uh, um, what happened in Massachusetts, you know, this is what happened. The Affordable Care Act was based upon what they did in Massachusetts a few years earlier. Um, and the reason that the Massachusetts plan was successful is because they they said if you don't have any health insurance you know, on your taxes, you're going to, have to spend about $1,400. So, you know, as a tax. So that's the way they tried to get young people in there because they knew if they didn't get young, healthy people um, in there is that then... The premiums would just go up and up and up, and it'd be a death spiral. So, did young people pay too much? Is that what that means for the in the Affordable Care Act? Did young people pay too much? Yeah, yeah. So, one of the criticisms of the Affordable Care Act is that you know healthy people pay too much, and what they mean is that healthy people pay more than than you know, than the, what their expected cost is. That's what it means. Is that a problem with insurance? I mean, with the Affordable Care Act? Well, I mean, it depends on how you look at it, because it, for, insurance should be insurance, right? Insurance should be not, you know, not for the small things that you have to pay for, but for the big things that are unexpected. So you know what what health insurance is really you know good for. It's doesn't not so much for covering your doctors, you know, when you go see a GP or whatever, it's that if you got cancer and you had a hundred thousand dollar bill for, you know, for your cancer treatment, that then it would kick in. So if you look at what happened, you know, with the Affordable Care Act, is that it actually would turn out to be much more popular than they sort of thought, even after you know Trump got rid of all the, you know, the penalties. So when Trump took office, he said he wanted to to turn, you know, get the Affordable Care Act into a death spiral. And so he took away all the penalties for um, for not having insurance. So like now in your taxes, you don't have to pay any penalty if you don't have insurance. 
But what they found is that enrollment in Affordable Care Act didn't really go down because it turns out that you know people generally like to have health insurance because uh, on the off chance that something 